Welcome to the History Slam podcast from ActiveHistory.ca. Here's your host, Sean Graham. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to the History Slam, everybody. I am Sean Graham coming at you today nearly live. We are in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and we are wrapping up our time in Cambridge. So what we're going to do over the next couple of weeks is interview some of the people who I've been working with since I got here. We've been talking to a lot of the folks around Harvard, but not really the people in the Canada program and the reason that I came to Cambridge. So the first of this series will be with our good friend Sarah E. K. Smith, who is a Shirk postdoc here in the Canada program, and we're going to be talking about her new book that is coming out on May the 19th, entitled General Idea, Life and Work. Welcome to the show. Great, thanks so much. So this book is really quite fascinating. We'll, t- we'll talk about the book uh, a lot later that you worked with the Art Canada Institute on, and we'll talk about the larger project. But first, I want to talk a little bit just about disciplinary things. It's, really, it's been a lot of fun being here and having the opportunity to meet people from other disciplines, non-historians. And you are not a classic historian, you are an art historian. I would object to the term non-historian, actually. Oh, okay, please, yeah, go. <laughs> okay. Well, one of the things that, that I think I've gotten a sense from is that you talk about using different methods and approaches sometimes from maybe the stuff that I use or, or Tracy, our other colleague, who's a historian, use. So in your mind, then, what is the difference between a historian and an, an art historian? Yeah, I wouldn't say there's a a huge difference. In fact, I often use the term historian of visual and material culture. I think the real difference when it comes to art history or the study of art is that I'm drawing a lot on visual and material culture. So whereas historians tend to go to the archive and do interviews, I do do those things as well. But I'm also going to be looking at artworks. I'm going to be looking at, you know, from the conventional painting to a contemporary installation. And that is also a, a key source. Source, uh, of information. But then the, the question I would have is that in my pop culture courses, what I'm doing with students, and even when I'm doing my radio stuff sometimes, is taking a form of media and analyzing it in, in a similar way that you're describing. So what is different from what you're doing versus, say, the assignment I give my students when I say, watch a movie, analyze it, tell me about it, like, and tell me what it means, what's the significance of it? Like it's, It strikes me that it's a very, very similar thing. So is it possible then that I am dabbling in art history, or are the two perhaps almost one and the same? That's such an interesting question. Yeah, this idea that you might assign your students a film and they'll do a critical analysis of it, which is probably you know somewhat similar to how I would analyze a video artwork. I guess the big difference would be that... Uh, my work is embedded within the kind of the traditions of the discipline, right? This this knowledge of you know how art and artists have been constructed historically, and that would really inform how I understand the artworks. You know, often art, artwork can sometimes be inside baseball uh, in many cases, right? Referring back to ideas of the artists or mythologies of the artist. So I think that plays into it a bit, if that helps. So we were at the the Museum of Fine Arts. Yes, we were at the MFA, the MFA. Uh, a week ago uh, looking at Lauren Harris and the idea of the North. Right, so we were looking through this exhibit, and Lauren Harris and the group of seven, I understand their paintings. Like, just intellectually, I get them. They're That's a bold claim. <laughs> they're, they're, no, okay, so I get why people like them. How's okay. that? And even for, people, for those Americans listening, they're very popular. <laughs> yes, very popular. I teach about the group of seven in the pop culture class mm-hmm. and their significance. Like, But... I think one of the reasons people like them, and, and or at least perhaps non-specialists like them, because the paintings look like stuff, right? And they're they're yes. cool to look at. And so one of the things you tried to explain to me when we were at the MFA last week is there 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 was a painting by Jackson Pollock. Uh, Jackson Pollock in there, and the actually the curator who was there who gave the talk mentioned that Jackson Pollock to him was like a god. Whereas I looked at the Jackson Pollock, and it's one of these paintings that I feel as though I could do, or that a four-year-old could do, because it looks like it's just paint thrown at the canvas, and it doesn't look like there's any skill involved. And so one of the things that always confuses me about art like that is that I, I can't understand why it's held up as being so great and so meaningful versus the stuff that you know looks like something to Lauren Harris, which strikes me as more challenging to do, just... As a, as a skill. Mm-hmm. 
But then you explained to me that one of the reasons Jackson Pollock is so highly regarded is that this was new, this was unique, and he was challenging the form, and yes. that's why people like it. What struck me as, as you were explaining that is that it seemed as though it's very much a historiography type approach, and you know the art that is significant in that type of avant-garde or whatever type of art it would be called is, un- is, is special because no one has done it before. And that seems more of, like you say, an inside baseball sort of thing that someone like me, and I think one of the reasons people criticize art, or more modern art, is that, again, it looks like anyone can do it. So is it really, am I oversimplifying it and and saying that it's art history at its core is a historiography type thing and trying to look at what has been done, how new stuff fits within old stuff? Is it... Is it is that too much of a simplification? Uh, I, that's so hard. I say yes and no. So it is simplifying it to reduce it to that. But at the same time, you know, the canon of our Western art history, um, I think it's really important that you quantify mm-hmm. uh, what you're talking about, this, uh, this idea of, uh, you know, art in the Renaissance and then things, uh, you know, always building on its past and kind of breaking down those barriers and boundaries. It is, it is reacting to what's happening. And this idea of the avant-garde or the artist as an individual genius, I mean, that's, uh, uh, I don't think that's what art today is about, but I do think that you can look at modern artwork, so kind of post-World War II artwork that way, for sure. And when you're looking at the visual then, is it the sense, too, of artists who are consciously creating art, or is it any sort of visual representation? Like, if we go back to, say, you know, petroglyphs, mm-hmm. right, w- w- could an art historian take an art history approach to that or is it more people who are consciously artistic and creating stuff for whether it be commercial gain or to make some sort of a, a point as like a Jackson Pollock would probably be making a point. Yeah, I, don't, I mean, images aren't created in a vacuum. Art isn't created in a vacuum. So personally, for me, in terms of my scholarship, I think it's very important to look at this larger scope of what's happening in terms of images. So often I say that I study visual and material culture. So that's kind of to signify that I'm not just looking at fine art, but I'm very interested in, you know, other promotional images or advertisements or things that are circulating at the time that might inform uh, how we look at artists mm-hmm. and their artworks. I think that's a really important context to, to remember because because the artists, of, of course, aren't just drawing from art history. They're, they're drawing from the world around them, reacting to that. Mm-hmm. And, and is there a sense in art history that the stuff that you know, is bold in that sense and that is making some sort of a point societally, culturally is of greater value or at least worth more study than the pure visual itself like the image on the page is that important and and, and like the say the people talk about brush strokes right i like to make fun of brush strokes (laughs) right like is that as important as sort of that contextual stuff and really understanding the meaning behind it or or trying to get the intended meaning like what like where's the balance there between criticizing I don't mean criticizing in a negative way but mm-hmm. criticizing the piece for its visual elements versus trying to draw out the meaning from it okay that makes me think of a lot of different things I think I think one thing is a bit hard to simplify it that way because some artworks that are being created now are uh, in the vein of social practice so they're kind of um, I'm thinking of project row houses, you know what I mean? They're works that are creating community and they aren't necessarily going to take the form of a finished, discrete art object that Mm. has brushstrokes that you can analyze. So sometimes... um, you know, if you think of performance art, um, the the action is uh, is is the end product more so than an object. So you can't really. I think it really depends on the artwork and the artist in that particular context, especially when you think about contemporary art, because it used to be um, the case. Well, I mean. When you look at art history, it used to be the case that there's there's these distinct movements where you can identify a certain type of art, like predominantly painting, um, as kind of uh, the medium du jour. You know what I mean? Where, yeah. where you can trace movements like um, impressionism and post impressionism and and things like that. But nowadays, the the landscape in terms of contemporary art production is so much more fragmented that you're having people producing you know realist paintings at the same time that you have people doing um, 
you know, activist art projects. Or So it's, it gets very hard to compare. So I think that decision about whether you should look at the message or the aesthetics, I think ultimately it would be great if you can look at both. But in some cases, depending on the circumstances, one's going to be more important than another. Yeah, it, it's interesting that you mentioned sort of this newer type art performance art. Yeah. Like when you go to a museum and you see this stuff, like the, the thing that I don't know if it bothers me or that I don't understand is that the explanations for them aren't clear. Like, there was a thing at the National Gallery in Ottawa that I, I remember vividly for some reason, and it was an artist went out and took pictures of license plates okay. around some city, and I don't remember what city. Mm -hmm. And so the installation was uh, all these pictures, and it was just sort of every five seconds a new license plate would come up, and there was nothing remarkable about oh, it. Oh, so it was like a video or a slide projection? Yeah, it was a slide projection. Okay. And there was no context. Like... It said, this guy went out and he took pictures of license plates. Here's what it is. Mm -hmm. And there's no mention of what he wanted to get out of it, what the meaning is, or, or anything. It's just, it's just pictures of license plates. Like, I look at that and it strikes me as like, what are we doing? Like, mm -hmm. like, what's the, like, what's the point, right? And I think that, when, cause so when you talk about, like, sometimes the image and the final product is more important, sometimes it's the meaning, like... Is that where it gets to the inside baseball stuff? Because I think for outsiders to art, and, and maybe I'm just speaking for me, but I think we want to know what the meaning is, particularly when it's not clear from the, the whatever that outward image is. Mm -hmm. And is there a sense that art then is very insular in that way? I'm okay if art is in, inside baseball because I know that there are some works that escape from that and that do transcend, that manage to connect with people. And I think it's too much to ask all art to be explained or contextualized always. Like there's something to the magic of experiencing an artwork or an installation or a performance and um, taking from it what you will or having a personal connection with that piece. Uh, so you can't, I, I think it's too much to ask that all art be explained. And I think mm -hmm. people have to go to a museum being kind of willing and open to connect and, and to have opinions. I mean, you obviously dislike this piece immensely and yes. that's, and that's fine. I mean, but there's probably other things that you liked and you haven't talked about those. So right. well, we've talked about clock, the before. clock, Christian Marclay's yeah, clock. We li which is I like, like clock. And that is a super contemporary piece. Right. Um, I mean, that was highly lauded in the contemporary art world and it toured internationally and definitely toured the National Gallery and the Power Plant. And so it's funny to me because if you could connect with that, I mean, did, did they explain the deeper meaning of that to you or did you just connect with it and enjoy it? I think it was just so weird, maybe. <laughs> and, and that what I really liked about it was that it was running in real time. So that if it was 3.30 in, real, in the real world, when you were watching Clock, it was also 3.30. Like they would pull a clip from the movie that was at 3.30. And the, the challenge of that, and like just the scope of having mm -hmm. to go through, find all these clips, put them together, that is what <coughs> amazed me more, I think. Or that's what I really took from it, is just the immense work that had to have gone into that. That's so interesting that you thought about the production. So for, for the people who are listening who haven't seen this piece, right, yeah. it's a 24-hour video work that's compiled from, um, I guess, films, like ho Hollywood films, all sorts of film references. And what they've done is they've only um, taken excerpts of scenes where you can see a reference to the time, like a clock or someone talking about the time. And they've stitched these many multiple sources together. So exactly as Sean said, what you're seeing is kind of you're experiencing uh, filmic time in real time. So when you go to see see this installation at four in the afternoon, you're seeing images about four in the afternoon. Um, I think I saw it in the morning and I also went during Nuit Blanche and I saw it in the middle of the night. So obviously right. like the types of movies and the scenes change dramatically depending, sure, yeah. depending on that. So it's interesting that you thought about the production because for me uh, I find that installation the experience is really jolting because you have this suspension of disbelief where you're looking at films and you realize that's what you're seeing and then you're thinking about those narratives but instantly you're brought back into this idea of real time right, right. so you're thinking oh my goodness now it's time is passing it, it you know you're you're it's this very strange embodied experience so that's what it was all about to me and so back to this larger discussion yeah. about art that's why it's so impossible to say you know that we need one message or one answer from a piece of art contemporary or historical right, right. because everybody has these different uh, experiences with an artwork. So 
Well, art historians are interested in, in kind of unpacking different messages and talking about, you know, the oeuvre of a different artist or art group. I don't think we'd ever want to spell things out too specifically in a museum. At least mm -hmm. I wouldn't. And you have curated stuff in the past. So yeah, you, so I consider you have, myself an independent curator. Yeah, yeah. So, so when you curate something, then your goal would be to allow the visitor to interpret the material themselves, that you want to provide the information of what the piece is, leave the interpretation? Usually when I curate, I have this idea that I'm, I'm making an argument through artwork. So almost like a, you know, a historian would put together a paper with data and arguments. I see myself as in a, in a show, I'm, I have a, a message or something to say, and it's either being evidenced by specific works by one artist or maybe multiple artists. So while I have kind of a larger message or theme or problematic I'm exploring in an exhibition, there is that latitude for people to go in and disagree with what I'm, I'm trying to suggest with these artworks mm. or have their own very personal experience with, with the art. Mm. So let's get into the book then, yeah, now that we've yeah. sort of established the, <laughs> we the background. We yeah. this stuff. <laughs> so the book, as I said at the top, it's entitled General Idea, Life and Work, and it's with mm -hmm. the Art Canada Institute, and it's part of this larger project that the Art Canada Institute has where they're doing a bunch of digital books. Yeah. And so this is one in this series. So how did you get involved as part of this series with uh, with Art Canada Institute? And what exactly is the Art Canada, Canada Institute? Because I'm not sure if a lot of people know know what it is. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So the Art Canada Institute is this wonderful mm -hmm. initiative that was put together in 2012 by Sarah Angel, who's based at the University of Toronto. And the institute itself um, is based at Massey College at U of T. And the goal is basically to promote the study of Canadian art history to the public, kind of at the widest possible level. So the Art Canada Institute um, does its programming in both French and English, uh, and their main platform Form is this beautiful website which you can find at aci-iac.ca and uh, they publish online art books and these are peer-reviewed books they're authored by curators and art historians uh, very well-known scholars of Canadian art history and they focus on particular artists or in the case of general idea and art group and they want to kind of explain their work and their significance and importance and make that publicly accessible um yeah and it's really cool for art to have these online books because whenever you pick up pick up like a coffee table book with a bunch of art in it it's always like a hundred dollars yes so to have these online and you can have the images there and everything is there it's a really smart idea I think I yeah and that's part of the reason it's so wonderful I mean the ACI has fantastic designers they have a really great production team uh, and it's so important images are so important when you're talking about art and when you want to learn about a different artist's work to see you know the range from early works um, all the way to later works and, and of course the best known works those images are so important so they really prioritize that in the mm -hmm. design of the books and the online format definitely helps so the other exciting thing is this online Online format allows you to do things like embed video. So right. in the case of General Idea, I was so pleased that they could uh, show clips of some of the key video works because they did a lot of video work. And it, you can discuss it and describe it, but that's not really the same as being able to access it and view it. So I think right. that's very important. The other thing that the online format allows for is also links uh, to lead you to different sections or to lead you to different websites. And they have a, a glossary that's really helpful if you're not familiar familiar with some of the, the terms being used. So I think it's a, a really flexible format. Right. So it gets away from that inside baseball exactly. stuff and so that people can come to it. So for this particular book with General Idea, now General Idea is or was a group mm -hmm. of artists and it was a group that until you started talking about it, I had not heard of before. So who were they? What were they about? How did they come together? Yeah, that's a great question. So General Idea is an artist group, so a collective. It was comprised of three individuals, so A.A. A. Bronson, Felix Parts, and Jorge Zontal. And they came together in Toronto in the late 60s, and they went on to become a great group that produced conceptual artworks for 25 years together. Um, the group ceased uh, their activities in 1994 when two of their members died of AIDS-related causes, but uh, the surviving member of the group, A.A. Bronson, maintains a successful solo practice in Berlin. So it's the three 
people? It's complicated. So okay. this is something. So when I, I knew General Idea as someone who studied art history, right. but I didn't actually realize how complicated their history was. So initially, they weren't three people. Initially, General Idea was a really uh, ambiguous, amorphous group of people who got together and did art projects in Toronto okay. in the late 60s, early 70s. And so in the early 70s, what happened, like, initially the group would put together things, do art things, um, and they kind of hid who they were, who was participating. It was just very collective, a very kind of um, non-hierarchical structure, kind of mm. going against this idea of, like, you know, artist as genius. And so in the early 70s, what kind of came to pass is that A.A. Uh, a. Bronson, Felix Pirates, and Horizontal were kind of, you know, the ones who were the most involved, and they decided um, to kind of reshape the collective's identity Entity and they became it became basically a tripartite structure and mm. so from that point forward they they keep carrying on with general idea projects but I think when you see general idea artworks in galleries in Canada or internationally it's often kind of just like of course general idea it's these three individuals but in the early days it, it wasn't it, they weren't mm. identified um, you know it was very shifting and they, they weren't focusing on, on their three individual identities within the group hmm can I add a further layer of complexity? Please. <laughs> I think it's also important to note that um, A. A. Bronson, Felix Parts, and Jorge Zontel, those were pseudonyms. So those are names oh. that they adopted in the early 70s. So the original, the three individuals, um, their, their original names who went on to become A. A. Bronson, Felix Parts, and Jorge Zontel, that was uh, Ronald Gabe, Slobodan Saya Levi, and Michael Timms. So that's kind of another kind of wrinkle in this in this history that is general Why idea. Why would they change their name? You know, that's a good question. So the adoption of personas was something that was actually common amongst male art networks. So male art is this... I'm, I'll just unpack that for you as well. Like it kind of emerges in the 1950s internationally. And so this idea of um, getting away from skilled production. So it's de-skilled production. It's often like collages or rubber stamping. Um, and people would basically make artwork that could be shipped in mail networks uh, to people internationally. And often those people involved in mail art networks adopted pseudonyms, different mm. pen names. Uh, so that's kind of part of this idea of of pseudonyms and, and the three individuals uh, in Toronto ad adopted pseudonyms in the early 1970s. Yeah. But A.A. A. Bronson yeah. still goes by A.A. A. Bronson. Yes, well, I mean... Or does that only... Does he only do that publicly? No, you know, that's a good point. So they, they really... In the book, I, I say there's pseudonyms or personas, but they really basically changed names. They they basically assume these names. But I mean, they're right. very cheeky, I think. Um, so Felix Parts, for a while, he went by Private Parts. Uh, <laughs> and then he goes by Felix Parts eventually. But they're very cheeky, provocative, wordplay, wisecrack kind of names. Right. It seems very professional wrestling. <laughs> they get these names that like have super, like, double meaning on them. Yeah. And, like, to a certain extent... Like, Hulk Hogan is Hulk Hogan, but he's also kind of Terry Bollea still. It's uh, like this weird So I mix. think there's less of that back and forth. So, I mean, A.A. A. Bronson's name, A.A. A. Bronson, I think in the early 70s, he publishes, he co-authors a pornographic novel, and he uses a pseudonym when he writes it, and that is A. period L. period Bronson. And then his friends misremember it and start calling him A.A. A. Bronson, and then mm. eventually they drop the punctuation, and he is A.A. A. Bronson with no punctuation and that I mean that's his his professional that is his 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 de facto name his professional name now that's what he he goes as um, as a professional artist so I guess once the pseudonyms or new names are kind of taken on in the 70s they don't really go back they're not signing artwork under two different names or, or mm. whatnot those are their names professionally like but personally they could still go personally they went by those names as well oh, okay yeah. so it's so it's really they're f it's almost a name change it's as opposed to like change, a, yeah. just a pure persona adoption yeah yeah sort of thing mm -hmm. so one of the things that it says on on the site about this group is that they were provocative they were controversial in their time and you you talked about the that they were very conceptual and i think you know changing your name and taking on a persona is a certain conceptual thing so what type of stuff were they producing? Like when you say conceptual, what does that mean? And why was it considered so provocative? 
in talking about general ideas practice, it's really hard to generalize. So the stuff that they are producing, they are producing work across multiple media. They are producing uh, performance works. They're producing installation. They're doing photography. They're creating artist multiples. Mm-hmm. They are part of mail art. They establish a publication called File Magazine. They go on to found a really early and important artist-run center called Art Metropole. I could go on and on and on. So so their, their practice... The one thing that kind of unites this all is this conceptual approach. So they're really interested in kind of, you know, upending viewers' expectations. They use a lot of mimicry and appropriation. Their works are highly ironic. So I think that's kind of the underpinning that can help you understand the group's work as a whole. So they're really trying to poke at people in a way. I don't know if it's is necessarily poking at people. I think they wanted to be different. I know A. A. Bronson has talked about, you know, there's these certain moments where the group has done things that was decidedly unpopular at the time. So this idea of the name general idea. So I think there's an interesting story to tell about that. Like this this group of friends who are all living together, they're connected in Toronto in the late 1960s through Rochdale College, mm-hmm. right, which is very well known. Mm-hmm. And the significantly they connect through Theatre Pass Mirai, an alternative theatre venue. And they're all living in this house in Toronto and they start creating these installations in this window at the front of their house. They're not really considering this art. So they're, so they're creating things and it's not quote-unquote, fine art. Do you know what I mean? They're not doing paintings. And so out of that, they're all also doing some individual projects as well. And then eventually they they have their first show. And and their first show, the piece that they put together is called General Idea. But Mm. people get confused and think that's their name. So that kind of sticks. So it has these kind of corporate overtones, this idea of like General Electric or whatnot. Right. Uh, so it's this interesting idea of like the industry, um, you know, that wasn't very popular at the time. Another thing that we could talk about that they did, not necessarily poking at people, but, you know, being provocative. In 1987, and something that the group is very well known for doing, is they produce a work that's for an exhibition in support of AMBAR in New York, so the American Foundation for AIDS Research. Mm -hmm. Uh, And what they do is they uh, appropriate a very well-known work of pop art by this American artist named Robert Indiana, who did this logo called Love in 1966. You might have seen the statue in New York, the Love statue. Yeah, the four corners, the letter. In the four corners, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. L O V E. So, what General Idea does is they create this painting um, and they, they make it A I D S, so AIDS. Mm-hmm. So, it's this kind of very provocative statement. It's somewhat ambiguous. I mean, it wasn't exactly politically correct at the time. And that's kind of, you know, it's very characteristic of what General Idea was doing. I mm-hmm. think they, they wanted to make big, bold statements, they didn't want to fit into the mold. Right. And that, the AIDS stuff is really interesting, too, because you're doing that in the 70s and 80s and you know, 80s it's starting in 87 and okay. then that kind of really a lot of their work is focused on the AIDS pandemic until 1994 okay and that's really sort of when the AIDS issue really becomes more mainstream in the late 80s sort of in the lead up I know I don't know if it even is mainstream so this is the well, moment well, where I'm there's thinking like, like magic like once magic Johnson okay. is diagnosed I, I believe that's 92 mm-hmm. um then that gets a lot more attention to it. But this might be a terrible frame of reference, but like Degrassi was talking about it in whatever, 89 or 90, whenever okay. they had that issue. So I think it's so important though, to remember that like at that time, like there was so much misinformation. There was so much, it was so mm-hmm. charged with this moral dimension, this homophobia, um, this idea that like in the New York times, I think, you know, put something out about AIDS calling it like a quote unquote gay cancer. Like I yeah. think this is still very much in the moment where, I mean, part of the reason general idea is creating this AIDS logo and they don't just have it on a painting. They create a sculpture. They create many different iterations of the logo. They even have it up in Times Square on the Spectacolor board. Mm -hmm. They have like an animation. So it's all about kind of naming the unnameable in this moment where there is, there's this fear, there's this taboo. So it's Mm -hmm. very, it is a very bold, activist, provocative statement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's the, you mentioned the homophobia, which is what Mm -hmm. I was going to ask about. And I just looked it up. So yeah, Magic Johnson 1991 is diagnosed with HIV. So this AIDS so this painting is, is 87. Four years before, yeah. Yeah. And you know, there, there are a lot of issues with the association of AIDS to the homosexual community in the even before the before the 80s. And 
when you're talking about a group being provocative and controversial like that, mm -hmm. for as much as they're advocating for AIDS and sort of this naming the, the unnamed, are they not also twisting at this idea of it being associated with homosexuality and pushing back against the homophobia that goes along with it at the same time? And was the reaction to this advocacy work for AIDS, was the reaction colored by homophobic language? I think at the time it really wasn't seen as advocacy work. There's a lot of great artists, activists like ACT UP in New York who were doing a lot of work to kind of like more activist work that was, and I think they or definitely general ideas, statements were critiqued for being too ambiguous. Like the mm -hmm. AIDS logo isn't giving you more information about AIDS or safe sex practices, right? right. It is just putting it out there. And, and general idea was influenced a lot by ideas of communication theory and whatnot. Um, so this idea of like a virus, do you know what I mean? They, mm -hmm. they were creating this virus and they had it on subway, subway systems, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? So I think it's seen as activist art in a certain lens, but at the time it, it was considered to be in poor taste. And I think people mm. charged it with not going far enough. And in mm. terms of this idea of, yeah, the homophobia, I think for sure general idea kind of on this whole other level is pushing queer identity. So it's something that the artists talked about pushing in their work. There's, there's certain pieces. So the poodle emerges in the the work of general idea as kind of this stand in for like the cliche of the gay artist. So there's, mm. uh, there's all this great imagery. There's poodle paintings of like fornicating poodles done in neon. Uh, there's these, there, the artists dress up and do self portraits as poodle. And there's this great <laughs> image called P is for poodle. So it's this idea. They said they're, they're kind of like trying to egg on critics to talk about mm. queer identity and talk about that aspect of their work. And it, it didn't happen for a very long time. People did not want to engage with that part of their work. Um, so I think that's certainly something the artists were trying to push boundaries in that, in that area. Mm. And that's a conscious choice that they're making. Definitely. Yeah, definitely a conscious choice that they're making. I think it's important to remember that, like, you know, the fight for LGBT equality was happening in the 1980s. And there's there's a lot of different stuff going on. It, for instance, uh, one thing I learned about in researching the book was um, Operation Soap which is this pivotal moment in Canada's fight for LGBT civil rights. Uh, so that happened in 1981 when there was a raid on a bathhouse in Toronto, and it led to the arrest of over 300 men, including one of the members of General Idea, Jorge Zontal. So, you know, there was, there was a lot of outcry mm. and protests and whatnot, which really galvanized support across the country, uh, reframing the struggle for equality as one of human rights in that period. Um, so I think general ideas work should be understood within, you know, all those other developments that are, are happening at mm. the time. So you, you touched on this a little bit, and I want to get into this idea of how this stuff was received mm. by the, the public. And, you know, you mentioned that this stuff was distributed widely. And were people aware of who was doing it? Were people supportive? You mentioned that some people felt that it was inappropriate. Other people felt that maybe it wasn't going far enough. But was there a, a general mainstream reaction to it? And, and were these guys thought of highly just, out, I'm thinking outside of the art world. You know, it's really hard to quantify reception outside of the art world. I can say in terms of like looking at general ideas practice over the years that they first received a lot of recognition. There were really people in Europe got it. People mm. in Europe, that's where they receive uh, a lot of their early major shows, though they did have commercial representation in Toronto from, from the really early to mid seventies with uh, Carmen Lamana gallery. Uh, but so they, they have the success in Europe and then later in the United States and later in Canada. And they talk about that and they said that their idea their their humor the, their use of irony they weren't considered serious artists in, right. in canada and they had you know a bit of trouble with that but that's in terms of the art world reaction and they found that the european um, european audiences really kind of understood their work and, mm. and picked up on the themes uh, a lot easier so did that make them commercially successful with this stuff yeah, so that's a great question because often art historians don't don't really get into you know this idea yeah. of commercial success. So general ideas work is is successful both in museums and as well as in commercial galleries. You know, the, their group is still uh, very successful today. Even so, right now 
in terms of museum exhibitions, there's a, a you know a catalog resume is coming out of their work in 2016. They're going to have a big show in Mexico City that's also going to Buenos Aires. Mm-hmm. Um, but their work is also shown at commercial art fairs. Uh, and and at the time as well, they they were both commercial artists as well as artists showing in, in museums. I mean, that's typically the case for artists. I just mm-hmm. feel that you know commercial relationships or artist relationships with commercial dealers don't don't always receive the attention that they should be given. Is that because it, there's a sense that the commercial takes away from the art a little bit? That it's not there, it's not being, the commodification of the art dilutes it in some way? Is that why? Like, Because this happened at the MFA last week, that, that he mentioned that they don't like to talk about art markets yes. or anything like that. And, and the sense I got was that by commodifying it, you take away some of its meaning or the power. There's something that, that's lost when it becomes commodified. I think that might be a perception. I don't mm. necessarily think that's true. And I think um, if you have a, a little bit of a sense of how the art world works, like dealers lend works to museums who do shows, it's, it's very much like kind of a network of things that are happening, mm. um, kind of the art ecosystem, if you will. Right, yeah, yeah. I do think that people tend to, to shy away from talking about, you know, commercial value and things like that, unless it's someone like Damien Hirst, right? Uh, you know, very prominent examples who have very, very high sales, you know what mm. I mean? That can kind of become a talking point for some artists. Right. You mentioned at the top that two of the members die in 1994, which is why the group comes to an end in 1994. Yeah. I'm wondering that, you know, because both of them die from... AIDS. Related causes, yeah. You know, how much of this work is spurned by the personal? And are they guided so much by their personal situations that it, it becomes this cause for them? And is that really relevant in studying the art, that personal situation? I think the personal situation is relevant, but I do think it's not the be-all and end-all. So I guess to explain a bit... Felix Parts and Horizontal were diagnosed as HIV positive about a year apart. Um, the dates are somewhat in, in dispute around 1989, 1990. So they do do the first AIDS painting in 1987 right. before there's that immediate personal connection, though, of course, AIDS was hitting their community, right? So there, there is still that a little bit of a personal sure. yeah, yeah. connection. And so after uh, the HIV diagnoses, uh, what happens is, uh, they're, they're especially interested in creating works that, that speak to the AIDS pandemic and, and also like works about pills. So that mm. becomes something that they turn to. So they do this great, a, a, a lot of pill work. So one of them is called One Year of AZT and it's done in 1991. And it's these enormous, it's enormous installation of um, 1,825 units of vacuum form styrene they basically they create these capsules um, these pill capsules that represent you know how the AZT regime uh, was kind of like taking over their lives you know what I mean how, how you're forced to t- take these pills at that time you had to take them on a, a schedule that required kind of you know interrupting your sleep like you're, you're on a very strict regimen to take right. these, this medicine on a, on a 24 hour schedule um, and they did another one called um, one, day of, one Day of AZT which is um, the same kind of pill capsules but they're enormous so they're basically like coffin size they're they're, mm. they're they're enough to kind of put a body in so they're very a very striking installation and often those two are shown together the one year and the one day so obviously that is informing their work both both immediate as well as, you know, more tangential connections to what the uh, AIDS pandemic is doing Mm -hmm. in the world is informing their work. But uh, that isn't that isn't the only thing informing their work. And I don't think that means that earlier works that they were doing about glamour or beauty pageants or things like that are are less captivating just Mm. because you can't uh, identify a a particular personal significance there. So it's important to read biography into works, but it, it can't be the only thing. Right. So what would you say, you know, after 1994 and the two guys pass away, like, what is their legacy? Because, you know, you're writing this book and, and you mentioned that they're successful in Europe and that Bronson still lives in Europe. Mm-hmm. But if they're viewed as a Canadian group and part of what the Art Canada Institute is trying to do is celebrate these Canadian artists, 
what is the legacy that they have? Yeah, I think that's a good point. I clarify a bit that they found early success in Europe, but then they find success in the U.S. and in Canada. Right. So it's not that they are not successful because by the the 90s, they're receiving you know lots of awards and accolades. So they are kind of they are very major figures in the Canadian and international art scene, very, very well known, exhibited everywhere, exhibiting in 1980 at the Venice Biennale, they exhibit at Documenta, they exhibit at the Sydney Biennial. So so that's important to know. But in terms of their contribution, they have an absolutely pivotal contribution to the Canadian art scene, because in the moment that they're coming together, the Canadian art scene is very fragmented. The Canadian art scene, it does not look like the American an art scene. Mm -hmm. um, it's this moment kind of when artist-run centers are emerging across the country. And so I think two things. I think the work alone, there's this legacy of General Ideas works, especially uh, I think well, their earlier works as well as the projects they did after 1987 about AIDS. But two other things that are important that they did is one is founding File Magazine. And that's a publication that they founded in 1972. And it ran for 26 issues and closed in 1989. But this is this really fascinating publication. Um, and it's, it's a takeoff. It's a spoof of the American Life magazine. Even like the name file <laughs> looks <laughs> visually similar to Life magazine. And in fact, so similar that they were life pursued legal action against them <laughs> until they changed that logo. And this is this really amazing magazine. They further the mythology about themselves, but they also have an artist directory. They're also working to connect Canadian and international artists together, especially artists using mail art, you know, mm. so they have addresses and whatnot. Right. So File, which changes greatly o over the years of its production, is, is initially a really important and it is an, a very important contribution to the Canadian art scene because it helps to connect artists and it also helps to show them what art can be. Another important contribution that they make is the founding of Art Metropole, and that's something that happens in 1974. So they found Art Metropole actually in their own studio in Toronto, and it's basically in part due to the large amount of mail art that they're collecting, because they're, they're doing so much with these mail art networks right. that they have all this kind of ephemera piling up. In fact, Art Metropole, they kind of initially conceive of it as an artwork, as an archive and a museum shop for the 1984 Miss General Idea Pavilion. So what they're doing with Art Metropole is it's, it's a distribution center. So they're, you know, it's very important for circulating video art in Canada in the early years. It also circulates publications. Um, it actually exists to this day in Toronto. It's a great place to go to. So not only are they doing really innovative conceptual work, they're also helping to kind of build the arts infrastructure in Canada. And it's interesting. The mail stuff is really interesting because that's something that would not happen in 2016. In all likelihood. Because of Canada Post. <laughs> well, just like, yeah, just like who uses the mail? Like, you know, I wouldn't say that. Um, like, it would be an email. Be I wouldn't email say art. that there's no more mail art anymore because I feel like there is. I don't know a lot about it. But this was a thing that emerges in the 1950s that is big in the 60s into the 70s. Mm. I'm probably... The general idea doesn't use it so much in their later years. But the general idea archive at the National Gallery of Canada has fantastic examples like it, as a as a researcher it's wonderful to like go through these files with this correspondence quirky things you know drawings and questionnaires all sorts of things uh, mm. that you can find in the archive mm. and for you then is is part of the legacy that they have you know how much of it is outside of the art world and how much of it is being influential to canadian artists who come after is there is there a public persona that has persisted for them that goes beyond people like you who are invested in the art world? Absolutely. I would say their works are well known internationally. I think it goes beyond kind of a, a just a an art historian audience. Their works, and especially because a lot of their works happened in public spaces, right? Mm -hmm. Especially with the AIDS logo projects that they did, this idea that this art was, you know, in Times Square, it was on subways, it was on billboards. Um, I think that's something that takes them outside of the realm of, you know, the white cube and really brings them into public perception. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't have any stats on, on how many yeah. people know about them, but yeah. I definitely think that they're a great example of a group who kind of, you know, transcend that. Also, I mean, their status as artists is such that they're, they're, they're very well known. Mm -hmm. So when people go to 
the website and get the book and look at the book when it goes live on May 19th. Yes. What should people expect? Uh, just in terms of format and what are the sort of stuff that you're talking about? Like, like how are people going to interact with the material that you have put together? The way the website is organized is very similar to how uh, the Art Canada Institute organizes its other online art books. So they have several sections. So there's a biography section where you can kind of read chronologically about the artists, how they came together, um, the trajectory of their careers. So another section is Keyworks, where they have write-ups on, on all sorts of significant works that they did, uh, video works, photography works, early works, late works. And for, in the key work section, you can access a clips um, that, of videos um, from the video works that are, are written about. There's a section on significance and critical issues, so you can delve more into this kind of ideas that they're interested in. There's a section on style and technique, so you can kind of learn what male art is or learn mm. a bit about the history of video art um, or what a multiple is. And there's two other sections one is called Sources and Resources, and that's going to give you a sense of some of the, the resources that I drew on when putting together the book. And if you wanted to look for further information, where you could go. So that has, you know, selected writings by General Idea, as well as articles about General Idea and links to interviews and more stuff like that. And the final section is where to see. So if you want just to get a sense of where General Idea's work is in collections all over the world, you can go to that section mm -hmm. And see if there might be an institution near where you live uh, where you could go see some of the works. So a very diverse group of, of materials there and, and something for everyone to sort of delve into. Like if you're interested in the methodology of it, you can find that. If you're interested in just the work itself, you can find that. And the interactive part uh, is pretty cool. I've had the chance to go through it a little bit Great. before it goes live. And like it is, like everything's sort of there and you sort of play around with it and you can find what you want to find. It's really interactive and it's a cool way to publish particularly for art. Yeah, I was excited about it. I really like this idea. It, as you say, it's very user guided. Right. So, uh, you know, if you're interested in knowing more about, uh, you know, certain work that they did and then following that through to figure out the type of work it was, whether it's a video work or mail art work, you can, you're very much directing your way through the book. Or you could read it in a more conventional manner. You can download it as a PDF and go through right. it um, from, 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 from the first part to the very last part. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's different ways of interacting with it. And also, because it's online I guess my hope and I think this fits with the larger Art Canada Institute aims that this is just going to be out there for public consumption that people who might not necessarily know about general ideas work might stumble across this or find this a useful source of information um, and maybe even just the first step in learning more about the group's practice mm -hmm. yeah one of the things we found with the site here is that you know when we when you look at the stats of who's visiting every day you know, everyday stories that we've posted or pieces that we posted, you know, from three, four or five years ago, people are finding them from Google searches or from however they're using, or however they're, whatever they're using, finding it. And hopefully they find it useful and helpful. And, and I know teachers reach out semi-regularly to us and say that, you know, their students have found stuff that we've done. So I feel okay. as though that, that what the Art Canada Institute is doing and books like this would have a very similar legacy in that, you know, the immediate release is great and people mm -hmm. will go and, and look at it, but that it's there, people will continue to find it over time and, and get good use out of it. Absolutely. You know, the one, I mean, I guess there's two things. The one thing is that they're continually building their title. So, right. you know, every year, the Art Canada Institute, every month is releasing new online books about different artists. So they're really building this amazing web library resource about Canadian art. The other thing that I'm really pleased about uh, to be a part of this project is, is the accessibility, uh, not just because it's online, but in the French language. So this is available in both French and in English. Uh, so I think it's very important that, you know, Canadian art history is known in both languages. So that's mm -hmm. a really, a really nice part mm -hmm. of the initiative. Yeah. And if you are in Toronto, yes, on May the 19th, at 6 o'clock, at the ROM, Sarah will be there. I will be there with A.A. A. Bronson, who's coming from Berlin, as well as Louis Jacob. And we're going to be having a conversation uh, called Inventing History and Making It Real. So it's going to be all about general idea uh, and their practice. Uh, so please come out next Thursday, May 19th, to the Royal Ontario Museum. And it's free, open to the public. Absolutely, yeah, open and to everybody. 
And it'll be, yeah, like you say, just a conversation. And, and there'll be a chance for uh, members of the audience to ask questions. Um, uh, me, Louis Jacob, or A. Bronson. Mm-hmm. So if, if you if you have something you're interested in knowing about the group, um, the, the book will be live that same day. Uh, so you can check it out and then come hear more about General Idea and their legacy. Yeah, we would encourage anyone in Toronto to go. And like you say, if you're not in Toronto, the book goes live on May the 19th at aci-iac.ca. And the title is General Idea, Life and Work. And again, it's the Art Canada Institute. So we would direct everybody there. If you're listening to this when it's going live, the podcast, that's next Thursday. If you're listening to it after May 19th, you can just go to the site because it's live right now. That's right. Yeah, go check out their other titles. They have a lot. They have Emily Carr, uh, Tom Thompson, Norval Morriso, Joyce Whelan. There's an amazing range of sources on that site. I highly recommend it. So that is Sarah E.K. Smith, Shirk Postdoctoral Fellow here at the Canada Program at Harvard. You can find her on Twitter at Sarah underscore E.K. underscore Smith. Also online, sarahekesmith.com. All her work is there. And if you are a fellow postdoctoral fellow and look at the writing section of her website, you will feel very in- inadequate about your own work. <laughs> yeah, uh, you're too kind. <laughs> so Sarah, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here and have the chance to chat with you. If you have any questions or comments for the podcast, it is historyslam at gmail.com. Twitter at Dr. Shawnee Fever. And if you're out and you see Enrico Palazzo, please say hi for me. Thanks for listening to the History Slam podcast. Be sure to check out Active History for more features, articles, and be sure to subscribe on iTunes.